This is a rebroadcast of the Eau Claire School Board meeting. The audio for this program can be heard on WRFP LP 101.9 FM. Call to order the Eau Claire School Board meeting. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, Secretary Iverson, have we complied with the open meetings law notification? Yes, I have. All right. Uh, could you please do a roll call to verify quorum? Commissioner Cummins? Here. Commissioner Duax? Here. Commissioner Hambach Boyle? Here. Commissioner Johnson? Here. Commissioner Spindler? Here. Commissioner Vu? Here. Commissioner Jean? Here. All right, great. Um, so uh, we have two signed up for the public forum. Just a reminder the public forum has. Uh, four minutes for speaking and uh, a total of 30 minutes, but I don't think we'll reach that tonight. Uh, so just state your name and address when you uh, come up. So first uh, we have Avis Knudsen. I am Avis Knudsen. I live at 615 Davis Avenue. I'm a food and nutrition employee for 20 years. Today at Food and Nutrition Staff Development Meeting, we asked for voluntary donations to feed my people in lieu of employees, cooks, giving management holiday gifts, and management giving us gifts. I am here to say the combined efforts of our cooks, their union, and Food and Nutrition Management, we collected $829.50 for Feed My People. Besides good food, we do good things. <laughs> Thank you so much, Avis. <laughs> All right, wonderful. Um, next on uh, public forum, we have Mark Goings. Mark? My name is Mark Goings. I live at E17450 County Road V, Augusta, Wisconsin. Um, as president of ECAE, I wanted to publicly announce that we met in formal session tonight and our members voted to accept the board's offer by a wide margin. We want to thank the board for their work on this contract. We look forward to partnering, partnering with the board as the comprehensive compensation review process continues. And I'm confident that we will all, that I'm confident that we all want to develop a compensation system that both attracts and, retra and retains an amazing educational staff for the betterment of all students served by the Eau Claire Area School District. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mark. Appreciate it. Okay, uh, next is reports, uh, superintendent's report. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to review the upcoming Board of Education events. Um, on December 2nd at 4 p.m. in the administration building, the Gifted Advisory Committee will meet. Um, on December 8th, um, Monday, there will be a closed session of the Board of Education and it will take place from 6.30 until 8.30. On December 15th at 10.30 a.m. in the administration building, there is a policy and governance committee meeting. On December 15th at 7 p.m., there is a school board meeting. December 16th from 4 until 6 p.m. in the administration building, there is a meeting of the Charter Choice Committee. Um, I received two communications this week which I wanted to share with the board and the public. Um, the Eau Claire uh, Chamber Education Foundation has uh, written us a letter uh, emphasizing that they have now been in existence for 13 years. And one of their goals is to develop community leaders and prepare our future workforce. And toward this end, they have developed uh, three initiatives which more or less partner with our own initiatives. One is called the Friends of the Foundation, which provides for the overall administration 
of the foundation and supports educational programs like the Real Life Academy, uh, for which nearly 800 students uh, each year attend from the various school districts in the area. They also have a youth leadership sponsorship which provides for $500 per student and supports the Chamber's Youth Leadership Eau Claire program, which is now in its 11th year and is dedicated to promoting uh, leadership among young people. They have been able to increase their class size from 24 to 30 students each year. And the last piece that kind of connects with our mission is the Youth Leadership Eau Claire Endowment Fund. Um, and this was created to uh, support youth leadership development programs such as Youth Leadership Eau Claire program. Um, and the goal of this is to fully endow the program at $400,000, which they hope to reach in the near future. Uh, but this letter was sent by Mark Faunus and um, I think was intended to kind of reach out to us and let us know what they're doing uh, on behalf of the students in this community. We also received a letter this week from uh, Mildred N. Larson, who's the coordinator of the Chippewa Valley Book Festival. And she was writing to thank the school district for serving as a major sponsor in this year's Chippewa Valley Book Festival. Um, she mentions a number of activities that were hosted, uh, you know, either by schools or school staff. And in particular, she wanted to thank uh, Pam Gardo at Memorial High School, who served on the Authors and Events Committee and managed the task of coordinating uh, the visits plus several to other area schools, and Ken Zemanski, an English teacher at South Middle School who taught a poetry workshop for young writers at Ellie Phillips Memorial Library um, and participated in the Young Writers Showcase. Um, Ms. Larson emphasized that the event for this, um, for the Chippewa uh, Valley Book Festival um, would probably not be as successful as it is without the teachers and the librarians in the Eau Claire Area School District. So we thank her for that recognition. And then finally, tonight we have a special student recognition, um, the Memorial Girls State Championship Cross Country Team is with us tonight and they're all seated there right in the front. I'm going to ask them to stand up. And as we reported at the last meeting, the team not, was not only uh, the state champion, uh, but the girls team had seven students named to the academic all-state team. So Mark Johnson is the head coach and is assisted by Angie Rush and Carrie Steele. And we would like to congratulate everyone for this achievement. And Mr. Johnson would like to say a few words on behalf of the team. And so I'm gonna give him just a few minutes of my time. There you go. Okay. As you can tell, I've never addressed the board before. <laughs> if I stumble over my words, I apologize. Um, my name is Mark Johnson. I'm the girls cross country coach at Memorial High School. Um, and I'd like to introduce my girls, at least some of them. There are 59 girls on the team, starting with the oldest girl that we have, Angie Rush, Hannah Roski, Zoe Smith, Sophia Smith, Elena Smith, and Caitlin Ganeld. Uh, we had almost 59 girls on the team this year. Um, truly an outstanding uh, group of young women. Um, we've had several good cross-country teams that have qualified for state in the past. We've uh, had a boys team that was third last year, um, several girls teams that were second, third, and fourth, but this is the first state championship uh, that we've ever brought home. Um, it was a fairy tale ending to our season. Uh, we were ranked 11th going into the, the, the state championship itself, and I think probably the only people that thought we might win the title were the ones sitting right here, but when it comes down to it, that's all that really mattered. Um, we had 59 girls, like I said, on the team, uh, 70 boys, and truly remarkable. Um, as you mentioned, uh, eight academic, seven academic all-state representatives that were on the girls' team. Uh, one boy, Patrick Tracy, also achieved that honor. Uh, they're all hardworking, 
team oriented supportive and caring uh, they have represented our school and community with class all season long uh, and I'd like to close just by saying thank you for supporting um, athletics uh, I know with rising costs and um, decreasing state aid um, some might find it difficult to fund athletics when it takes dollars away from other programs but I can tell you uh, athletics do serve an, uh, uh, an academic purpose an educational purpose and I guess the best way I could explain that is to convey a, a personal uh, message from about four years ago I know these girls were not in high school then but my father passed away uh, the third day of our cross-country season and the funeral and visitation was that Saturday and it was a beautiful Saturday but there were carloads of kids that drove up to Cumberland for the visitation and the funeral when they could have been on a beach somewhere on a Saturday afternoon um, that type of spirit caring supportive attitude I know is fostered by parents uh, raised by parents but um, the kids also embrace that while the faces are different they have that same same spirit that I saw four years ago uh, and it's truly a blessing uh, to see that happen um, I don't always find that it's easy to teach that kind of attribute in the classroom but I see it far more readily on day-to-day -day basis in the girls that I coach in athletics and the boys too so I know I got a little long-winded here but thank you very much for continuing to support athletics like I said it does serve an educational purpose thank you Thank you so much. Congratulations to the team. And President Spindler, we also wanted to notice that their championship trophy is back there too. So you might want to look at that. It's pretty impressive. Their trophy. Yes. Right. All right. Ah, it's so great to celebrate things at these meetings. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Um, again, that's next to my president's report. Um, just a reminder, today is the first day for candidates for the school board to circulate nomination paper signatures. Um, and there's two positions up for election this year, and the terms are for three years. So if you're interested, uh, please see our business office to learn more and obtain nomination papers and more, more information. Okay, uh, reminder to board members, the national board annual conference is uh, March 21st to 23rd in Nashville if you're interested in that and finally there's an eggs and issues at UW Eau Claire that's where they're having it uh, in Davies uh, for those who are interested in eggs and issues and it's December 19th if you want to sign up for that <coughs> okay uh, so student rep reports who would like to go first Hannah or Jonah okay go ahead. First today. Um, I actually don't have much to report on um, I know that um, well the boys basketball season starts off tomorrow so that's pretty exciting. I know a lot of the students are really excited about that, especially coming off this nice long break, which was really nice to have. <laughs> and I know that we're excited about holiday break, too, because it's a longer one this year. Um, <laughs> and then the girls' basketball season starts off on Friday. So having both home openers this week, there's a lot going on, a lot of good school spirit. And then um, I know I brought this up earlier this year, but I just kind of wanted to touch on it again. I brought up the idea of weighted grades being reconsidered. And um, I think that if weighted grades are not up for consideration, that a reevaluation of how class rank is determined should be evaluated so that um, course rigor is a factor in how students are ranked in their class. And yeah, that's my report. <laughs> OK, thank you, Hannah. Uh, Jonah. Um, so last week, or two weeks ago, in the public forum, you guys had the Jonah organization come in, and they they were talking about a safe schools initiative that they were having with student or just young people around the area taking pictures of um, places places where they felt safe in the area. So I brought that to student council, and we're on board with that, and we're going to start working with that. But then I also looking at the at the Jonah handout that they gave us, um, I saw their environmental page and being a nature not I kind of looked at that for a second and student council has actually been working on a working on a composting like getting a composting project started at Memorial and um, Jonah has actually worked with schools in the past doing that so we're gonna contact Jonah and we're working on a project with them to get a composting thing at Memorial so that's pretty cool thanks for being so proactive yeah also yeah get you that compost yeah <laughs> um, also 
Last weekend we had the musical. I just want to thank you guys for the continued support for the arts and everything. And then one more thing. You guys know for PBIS we have homerooms. And every, every month I believe we have homerooms. And what I'm doing, I have a survey re ready to go for a homeroom coming up. But then I'm going to contact you just so you guys know. So you guys can get me information of what you guys do. So the general population of Memorial knows a little bit more about what the board does. So that's it. Thanks. All right. Great. Thank you. Very proactive group. Um, yeah. So other reports. We have a number of committee reports. Uh, first, uh, Catherine, do you want to give the foundation report first? Sure. I'm uh, one of the representatives to the Eau Claire Public School Foundation uh, organization, which supports the public schools. And I'm so happy to report that last month we gave 11 grants, which was approximately $8,000, <coughs> to uh, schools who presented projects that they wanted to do at their school. So 11 of those were awarded grants. And that's every school has something called a fund for today with their wish list. And that's been quite successful. We have another grant cycle starting January 15. So if anybody has a project that they'd like to do for their school, they can submit that. And we have some money left over. Okay, that's it. All right, great, thank you. Well, I, I'll do just I say that foundation has just been so wonderful for our district. And we appreciate all the support we're getting for it. Yeah, I think it's been a great service since it's really been reactivated in the past number. Uh, Chris, do you want to give the uh, policy governance report? Yes. Today? Um, we met today and we did the following. We made adjustments to the fund balance policy and I think we're going to look at it this evening. And we also discussed graduation requirements and future work on the open enrollment policy. Thank you. Okay, great, thanks. And I think we also have a report on shared services from Catherine. Some of you may not be aware, uh, those of in the audience may not be aware that there's a joint commission on shared services between the city, the county, and the school district. And we met last week, and some of the things that we have been working on are, are joint purpose, uh, purchasing, and that project is in full swing so that all three government governmental agencies uh, share that purchasing power so that saved us some money and that's one of the purposes of this think tank called shared services is to uh, work together more efficiently find ways that we cannot duplicate efforts and try to save some money and time uh, they're also looking at joint health care insurance uh, land, there is a land management project to, to discuss how we do not duplicate, should not duplicate land management records. Um, sharing administrative functions and also the next big thing is sharing space and facilities. So there will be a study on that. Great work. I think it's a great committee for that. Uh, oh, yes, and then the legislative update from Chris. Go ahead. Um, not much to report, um, but I would like to highlight one of the things that uh, WASB put up on their legislative update. Um, things that have been listed here are the Republicans pushing new school accountability bill, group announces lawsuit over open enrollment program, special need voucher bill will be back next session, and the Wisconsin Department of Transportation introduces a budget request which possibly could impact school funding. Um, you can go to WASB.org and read those in more detail, but the one I wanted to highlight was um, a positive one. College uh, School Administrator Alliance releases a policy agenda. Um, the School Administrators Alliance, SAA, a group representing school district administrators, principals, school business officials, administrators of special education services, and school personnel administrators this week unveiled what it describes as a new evidence-based legislative policy agenda. Among other things, the new policy vision 
includes a wish list ranging from greater investments in early childhood education and school-based mental health services to more money for school technology and innovation to allowing districts a greater, greater annual increase to the per pupil amount that they can raise through state aid and property taxes. So they are, um, they are banding together in a plan that also calls for attracting higher quality candidates to educator training programs and help for school districts to recruit and retain high quality teachers. And there's more um, information at some links on WASB.org about the evidence-based agenda policy. There's an overview of the evidence-based policy agenda and there's also a Milwaukee Journal Sentinel article. So, thank you. Great, thank you as always, Chris. Um, next is the consent resolution. Uh, for the consent agenda, the board's been uh, you know, furnished with background material on each item or it's been discussed at a previous meeting. These will be acted upon with one vote without a discussion, but if a board member wants to discuss any item, they can pull it from the consent agenda and vote it on separately. So I would entertain a motion to approve the minutes of November 17th, 2014. A motion to approve the minutes of the closed session of November 17th, 2014. A motion to approve the Human Resources Employment Report. And a motion to approve the, uh, the Policy 185 Board Committees that we had the first reading on last time. So moved. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. We have a second from Catherine Duax. Okay, um, yes, we can do a voice vote on this. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Uh, so we have several uh, individually considered resolutions. Um, before we go into our work session, um, you'll see that there are three listed here. Um, the, the one that Mark Goings had mentioned, the ECAC master agreement, uh, and the second is a ratification of the Ask me one, and that one we will not vote on because that has not been ratified as of yet. Um, and then the third is the possible rat ratification of the Ask me Food and Nutrition Master Agreement. Um, so let's go to the first one, uh, ratification of the 2014-2015 ECA Master Agreement. I'll just uh, read to you what it is. Um, it's a base wage increase of 1.46%, maximum allowed by law without going to referendum which means a base wage increase dollars available of $616,535, oh, sorry, sorry, $616,535. Uh, so this was through meet and confer sessions with union leadership. Um, they wanted to maintain a lane movement and longevity movement on the salary schedule. Um, and it's in both our district and the employee's interest to do so. Um, and so the monies for lane and longevity movement were at which are supplemental payments come from the original base wage dollars. So no additional monies are provided to allow for those payments. Um, the remaining dollars thus, they allow for a $545 per cell increase on the salary schedule. So I don't know if you have anything to add to that, Kay, or okay. So that's uh, what we would ratify tonight. If I could have a motion to approve and a second. So moved. We have a motion to approve, do we have a second? Second. We have a second. Any comments or questions on that? Okay, I think we should do a, um, vote, a formal vote on this. <clears throat> Commissioner Cummins? Yes. Commissioner Hambach Boyle? Yes. Commissioner Duax? Yes. Commissioner Vu? Yes. Commissioner Jean? Yes. Commissioner Spindler? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Thank you. Motion has passed. Uh, so, as I said, the buildings and ground master agreement was not ratified in the contract tonight, so we will not be addressing that one tonight. So we will go on to the food and nutrition master agreement, and I'll just read that one. Uh, it's the base wage increase of 1.46%, uh, which is the maximum allowed by law without going to referendum. The base wage increase dollars available is $10,787. So this allows for a 0.19 per cell increase on the salary schedule. Uh, so we would need a motion to approve that and a second. I so move. We have second. a motion from Catherine Duex, a second, second. from Chris Hambuck Boyle. Any discussion, comments, questions on this? Seeing none, uh, can we have a roll call vote on that, please? Commissioner Cummins? Yes. yes. Commissioner Hambuck Boyle? Yes. Commissioner Duex? Yes. Commissioner Vu? Yes. Commissioner Jean? Yes. Commissioner Spindler? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. All right, motion passes. Thank you. 
All right, so now we should adjourn to our work session. And I see we don't have tables in the middle. We'll have oh, to we have, move them. We have one committee report. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I missed the committee. Oh, excuse me, I forgot that. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, adjourn to our committee. Uh, we have a discussion and possible first reading of the new policy, 662.3 fund balance, which we had um, discussed some last time. Do we have that up there? Okay. So this is a fund balance policy to guide us on maintaining our fund balance. Uh, any questions, comments from board members on this? Um, I think we would need to do a reading again on this. Um, anything at all? Uh, yes, Commissioner Johnson. So all the stuff in yellow obviously is new, with the, and that's new As since the last today. time we saw it. Okay, so just on um, that section, um, we recognize the need, so the second paragraph, then the bullet points, to carry an operating reserve to provide adequate working capital sufficient to meet cash flow requirements. If it's adequate capital sufficient to meet the cash flow, that to me that says we would be doing no short-term borrowing at all, that, our, that we should be carrying a fund balance big enough to cover those ebbs and flows. Is that the intent of, of what, what you were thinking when you wrote that bullet, no, point number one? Actually, we borrowed it from another policy, as you can imagine. I think it also was in, so as not to lock into a particular percentage mm -hmm. that we don't want mm -hmm. to. Some districts are 10 to 15, some are 20 to 25, 25 to 30. We, we want maximum flexibility for our leadership and so that's where that came from yeah and I and I like you know that there's some flexibility built in but I'm just afraid that th that provide adequate working capital sufficient would open up the board if we don't have absolutely enough in working capital to avoid all short-term borrowing that someone would come and say you're violating your policy because you don't have enough fund balance sufficient to meet your cash flow needs if we're borrowing it's not sufficient so I just wonder if there's a, you know, I think that previously that it was striving to, um, you know, and working towards that, but that just number one says to me that there wouldn't be. I didn't, I don't think we took it that way when we were working on it today, but I think it would be perfectly okay to take it back to committee and pull Dan back in because we were, you know, we used some other wording and see how we would interpret it that way. So that's a good I mean, it's a good point. And uh, I would just comment on that same point. On the end, it says um, uh, maintain a year-end fund balance in the general fund in a sufficient amount that avoids the need to short-term borrow for cash flow pro purposes. So just whatever you do, make sure that sentence is consistent with that number one because they're basically saying the same thing. So make sure they're not contradictory, whatever you come up with. Um, so agreement with the board and go back one more time. I kind of hate to do well, that to you, but <laughs> we've never had this policy before. So I think it takes some good input discussion and input discussion to come up with a good one. So thank you. Okay, great, great. Thank you for the work you're you're putting in on that. Okay, let's see. I hope we didn't miss anything else. So now we'll go into adjourn to work session. Uh, okay. Discuss the tables. Yes, and we'll move the tables together. So we'll take a short break to do that, put our tables together, and I think Bob will have time to set up his presentation for us. So, all right, great, thank you. So first thing is, uh, Bob's going to, oh, I want to say, Chu, uh, you might have to leave at times, you know, if he walks out. It's not because of you, Bob, or anybody else. <laughs> He's got some work to do. Uh, so Bob's going to just briefly show us some things, the slide binder that he created to help us out um, through the process. And then he's going to kind of frame um, the material for us. And <coughs> definitely three things you would like a sense of, at least by the next meeting, is kind of what's our, our questions about sustainability and resources, um, what kind of um, compensation uh, uh, possibilities are we interested in, not interested in, for example, pay for performance. And um, our, uh, you got to think about hold harmless also was the other thing, uh, whether or not we would go back and pay in some way. Uh, so I'll let Bob, you, you take it now. And, uh, All right, thank you very much. So what you have up on the screen is a link to several 
different documents that are coalesced in one spot through this program called Live Binder. And what is in here is a compilation of various things, and it's, it's a living binder, just like any hard copy binder you would have that things can get placed in and out, but I find it very productive for groups like a compensation committee where you're working, you're, you're bouncing off different ideas off of each other to coalesce everything in one spot. And you'll see, first off, we start with something as simplistic as the agendas. That particular tab is empty at the present time. But then there's examples of other alternative compensation plans. And these are not here from any standpoint that I am endorsing these or seeing this as the all-inclusive universe of potential compensation plans. But they are representative of some various approaches that particular school districts took within Wisconsin. Some of them have been around longer than others. You'll see some of them are geographically proximate to you, some are not. So they're not necessarily comparable. And this is a fluid document. So as we go through this process, if someone finds another alternative compensation plan, whether it's within the state or outside of the state, then those are ones obviously that can be put forth so that the study committees can look at these. And these that I have tabbed now, I should mention, are for professional educators. So that's just what this, live, this particular binder is structured primarily around professional educators. There are some tabs that cover other employees. One of the things that Rich briefly made a reference to was you know, whether merit comes in it or not. And I'm again not making an advocate uh, position to include or exclude, but for illustration purposes, we have some background information on the Charlotte Danielson framework for teaching and how educator effectiveness can go on. And that could be populated with additional items as we move through there. We also have your present employee handbooks and the changes that were made to those that are in it. And then one of the items that was sent to you in advance of the meeting is a PowerPoint presentation. And due to the fact that I really wanted this to be a work session versus a presentation, and that's what Rich and I talked about, this is here as a resource document for you to go back and reflect upon. Uh, there's all sorts of links within it to, again, additional compensation plans to contrast particular subject matters within it. So for illustration purposes, if we went to one, for example, like this, uh, these are some of the earlier school districts in the state that put in an alternative compensation system. And again, this is not a standpoint where I'm saying that these are great plans or that they have flaws, but they were early adapters. And so, or early adopters, excuse me. And so because of that fact, we can kind of see how they've migrated on through the process. And what's interesting from an outsider's vantage point and having worked with some of these districts on it, but then seeing how they progress through the years. They all started with a version 1.0, and they've all modified the plans after they've been put in effect. So they're a living, breathing document, just like your collective bargaining agreement was. You know, it's something that it's, it's not of, well, we've done it, we've nailed it. That hasn't been the experience that I've seen within the state or even from outside of Wisconsin. Because although this is maybe new to school districts within Wisconsin, and when I say new with like quotation remarks, marks around it because we have had some school districts like the Wanakee School District that's had what we call a, an alternative compensation plan for about 15 years. But by and large, our compensation systems were roughly similar from district to district, even if the pay levels were different. So these various examples are within the PowerPoint, but they basically um, structure are structured around a few main concepts. And what those concepts are, and this is for part of the conversation uh, period, and we'll skip this legal considerations for now, is looking at what it is that you wish to put in the pay system. And whether these are knowledge and skill based elements, whether it's educators evaluation, whether it has something to do with supply and demand differentiation, or whether you put in something on student learning outcomes. No matter how you do it, um, one of the common questions that comes up, and that's why I stopped on this slide, is that what is the path for a starting teacher pay to veteran teacher pay? When we survey staff on this, because that's one of the steps that I would recommend you do, is to survey your staff to see what is it they feel will attract and retain people within your school system. A common answer, the most common answer is that there's some pathway that an employee can see how they can proceed through their career if they stay in the school system. So what are they going to be rewarded for and what will it look like in the long run? So there's a lot of information in that that you can reference as we go through it. Uh, the other piece 
on here is, as I mentioned, there is a, this is a template of a survey that can be sent out to staff. It takes about 15 minutes to fill out an answer, but it will highlight various elements. We'll get demographics as to which building replied, et cetera. I do not set it up so that it is personally identifiable to the respondent. Right? I know when the person replied, we know it, but we do not the report and summarize that report to, to share it with the board to say, oh, Butler answered the survey this way, this is what motivates Butler. That's not the goal of it. We're looking at an overall compensation system, not one for an individual. But we'll ask general questions here about what do you think were the one to two, one to three strengths of the last salary grid that you had, which is in this tab over here. What were the weaknesses? And then what would you rank as things that are most important to least important? that you'd put into it. So that people can give us feedback as to what they perceive as being a valuable tool. And there will be divergences with these answers, but the way the formulas are set up, we'll see how things relatively rank in that process. So if you choose to do the staff survey, this is a uh, an example of one. And these questions can be tweaked. I mean, they're customizable, obviously, to each individual school district. And then there's information on what your present staff are making. So based upon your ratification this evening, this grid will change somewhat, but we have your last salary schedule there as well. <coughs> and then one of the other pieces in here, which Dan was kind enough to send uh, some data to me, but we're, we're going to have to update this, is have, when we talk about how the district retains people, one of the things that comes up is often, well, what is our turnover? And one of the things that school districts are experiencing in Wisconsin that had taken place in other states, but we really didn't have it to the same magnitude as the level of turnover. And anecdotally, we hear a lot of stories of people that are very concerned that, well, our turnover rates, we, we believe are to be exceedingly high. You know, we're at 12% now. We used to be at six. So what's going on in our district? And there may be some of that that's introspective you look at. I'm not going to discount that. But that is, uh, unfortunately, to some degree, becoming a trend throughout the state. So that if you have had that experience with a, an upward tick in turnover, and you say, well, how do we, that compare to a Chippewa Falls or a Menominee, et cetera, uh, my hunch is you're no different. Right? That has generally been the case. There's been a lot more fluidity in staff. And it's, some of it's tied to the compensation system itself. Some is tied to other elements that kept people in particular districts, post-employment benefits, seniority-based layoff provisions, or assignment provisions. So as those items changed post Act 10, there were those other elements that were no longer present. So we've truly entered an era of heightened free agency. So one is to get a sense of what the turnover number is. And then be even more important than that is to try to look at and figure out what I've characterized as the unavoidables versus the avoidables. So the unavoidable transfer is the spouse gets transferred to the Twin Cities and the desire is for the family to live together in the same city. Your compensation system wasn't necessarily going to keep that person there if the spouse's job was significantly higher pay. They're going to migrate out. Or if they had a health reason, that the compensation system wasn't going to keep them employed if they have a health reason. I have an unavoidable being retirement. That's perhaps a gray area. You know, the employee may have retired at some point. If they're in their mid-50s, they're going to retire at some point in time. They may have retired earlier based upon the compensation system, but I've slotted in there. So it's to get us a sense for if people are migrating out, what is it that we can do to keep them here? And obviously the compensation system is going to primarily focus around extrinsic factors on pay and other working conditions elements, but there may be a lot of intrinsic <laughs> matters that come in place as well. And as Rich mentioned, one of the goals in this process is to hope to do no harm. So for example, if you've set up professional learning communities and you have a real strong collaborative work environment, we want to take that in consideration in setting up a pay plan that it doesn't work at cross purposes with that particular environment that you've created. So you'll see that there's that kind of information present as well. And so we can supplement any of these various tabs all the way through to get an idea of what this library of materials is that we have to look at to try to help formulate a new pay system. The other piece of it is that I was asked to do was to go through some general overview questions with you and just have a discussion on that. 
So I wasn't planning on going through the PowerPoint presentation. I figured you could use that as a resource, but I did want to have that conversation with you on those set questions. So if that works, I turn off the mic here and come down and join you at the table if that works. This program was recorded and presented by Chippewa Valley Community Television. Chippewa Valley Community Television is made possible by continuing community support. If you would like to volunteer or make a donation, you can contact us by calling 715-839-5067 or on the web at www.cbctv.org.